Good evening and welcome to everyone who's joined us this evening. Andadi is a historical research and museum consultancy uh, I founded earlier this year, and we have an extraordinary interest in South Asia and its diaspora and hope to produce some unique research in this field. Our name Andadi is intended as a constant reminder that we intend to write the history of this culture and community where it left off, a statement that the writing of history has no beginning, Adi, or end, Antam, and that it requires a constant revisit of the past cycle of events. We intend to host biannual lectures online or in person to bring together researchers who have a deep interest in South Asia and its cultures, its intersections with Southeast Asia, as well as its diaspora. The Andadi is among the earliest formats of Tamil literature adopted by early migrants in Singapore. And we're delighted that we have Dr. David on this topic. I ask that everyone keep the mics uh, muted as we are recording this session, um, especially for those who are unable to attend. So we'd be really grateful if you would keep your microphones muted until the question and answer session. Before I introduce Dr. Schulman, I wanted to take a moment to tell you a series of events that has kept me just a step behind from hosting Dr. Schulman for a lecture. I don't think he'll remember, but it was in 2007 that I first had the pleasure to hear Dr. Schulman address a gathering in person, having only read his works until then. He was speaking at my then new workplace, a private museum in Chennai on the subject of mural painting traditions in Southern India. And I realized the breadth of his experience from visual art traditions to music, to literature, and really an all rounded approach to understanding the complexity that is Tamil and its culture. Fast forward to 2017, and I was gifted a book by one who was supposed to be among us. I'm not sure if she's here yet, Jaya Jaitley, who said she couldn't think of anyone who would want that book more, and she handed it to me. And that was, of course, what many others before me have described as Dr. Schulman's magnum opus, Tamil, a biography. Albeit inspired or rather set in the concert format, when I read the book, I thought that it was something of a moment of an andadi, that it would inspire scholars to carry on perhaps where he had left off perhaps to attempt the writing of a biography of the literature of Tamil diasporas. Mr. Arun Mahirnan, a steadfast champion of Tamil literature and culture in Singapore, and I had hoped to invite Dr. Schulman to write a foreword to the volume we co-edited, Sojourners to Settlers, Tamils in Southeast Asia and Singapore, but that was not to be. And then I found quite by accident that all it took was a name to spark his interest. Earlier this year, when Andadi was newly found, I had written to Dr. Schulman to ask if he would deliver our inaugural lecture. And he replied, what a beautiful name you have chosen for your organization. And from there, this was born. The intent of our biannual lectures is to bring together scholars and researchers from around the world for us to consider their methodologies and research devices when studying Tamil that we can then adopt when studying Tamil diasporas in this part of the world. For instance, in the Kalvale Andadi of Sinatambi Pulavar, I would see a parallel to how we could understand the later Singhai Nagar Andadi, a collection of 100 devotional hymns written by Yarpanam Sadasiva Pandita, published in Singapore in 1887, dedicated to the presiding deity of the Tank Road Dandayudapani Temple. With that, I would now like to introduce Dr. Schulman. Dr. David Schulman is an Indologist, a historian of religions, and a poet. He is the Rene Lang Professor of Humanistic Studies at Hebrew University and is a MacArthur Fellow, Israel Prize Laureate, and Rothschild Prize recipient. Dr. Schulman is the author of many important anthropology and philology themed works focusing on South India, including Temple. Tamil Temple Myths, Sacrifice and Divine Marriage in the South Indian Shaiva Tradition, among others. His recent magnum opus, Tamil, a biography, presents perhaps the most comprehensive cultural history of Tamil, a living language from pre-modern times to ours. He will be speaking today on the Andadi before making a deep dive into the work of the 18th century virtuoso poet, as he has described him in a past working paper of his, named Villavarayar Sinatambi. 
of Kalvale, which was situated close to Jaffna city. Without further ado, I would now like to invite Dr. Shulman to deliver his lecture, which will see us through the next hour. There will be half an hour for questions at the end of the lecture. As we are recording this session, we ask that you keep your audio muted until the Q&A session. Dr. Shulman, please. Thank you very much, uh, Nalina. Manakam um, to all of you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, first of all, I just want to say I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to wish um, the Andadi specialists um, much success and happiness. Um, it's an honor for me to be giving this inaugural lecture. And as Nalina said, um, I'm very happy with the title that the group has chosen. And so it's an opportunity to talk about Andadi, uh, first of all, in a somewhat general way. And then we'll be looking specifically at one of the uh, most beautiful of the Tamil Andadis, the Kalvalai Andadi of Sinatambi Pulavar. So thank you. And also thank you for um, solving the mysterious um, problem that we had with the connection. I suppose it's because we didn't make an offering this morning to Kalpaka Vinayaka at the Kalvalai Temple. We somehow forgot to do that. Um, but we've solved it, you've solved it, and it's wonderful to be here with you. So uh, I'm going to begin with some general remarks about Andavi. I have a feeling most of you in the audience know uh, what, what it is and how it works, but let's uh, go through it. Um, we'll take a couple of uh, early examples before we move on to the text of Sinatambi Pulavar. So um, Andadi, it's a, a literary device, one could say, uh, a formal device uh, adopted by Tamil poets. Not only Tamil poets, by the way, we have Andadis uh, in all of the South Indian uh, languages and literatures, also in Sanskrit, the word itself is a Sanskrit word, anta adi, ending and beginning. Um, I've given you the words of T.S. Eliot, that is the title of this lecture, and the end is my beginning from the four uh, quartets. And um, it describes uh, very well exactly what an andadi is. Uh, in an andadi, what we find is that the final phonemes or uh, words, or sometimes an entire phrase of a poem become the opening words or phonemes or phrase of the following poem. So each poem in an andadi is linked together by this, um, let's call it a kind of a phonetic or phonemic ending and beginning. Um, which um, link together the entire series, whether, uh, whether we're talking about a, a, uh, Andadi composition of, let us say, 100 or 108 verses, or uh, a larger one like the Tiruvai Mori of, of Namarva, which has a thousand some verses. In all of these cases, we have a kind of circular or cyclic um, uh, pattern uh, linking the verses together. So that in a way, reading an andadi or listening to an andadi is a process that never comes to an end. It's not as if you could um, read the work through in a linear progression from beginning to end and stop at the end because there really is no end. The final phrase of the andadi is going to be the initial phrase with which the work began. So think of it again, let me say, it's a kind of circular um, literary form, uh, which opens up into a kind of infinity so that the poem in a way uh, never actually ends. In fact, one might even say that um, being uh, inside an Andadi text is um, being somehow caught within the magical circle of this text. It's hard to find an exit from it. Um, and maybe there, uh, maybe that's the whole idea is that there should be no exit that fits in particular the world of the bhakti devotional oriented uh, andadis, um, where in fact uh, the poet or the devotee or the listener uh, doesn't want to exit the immersion experience in, in the text, uh, he or she wants this experience to go on forever. 
So Andade, you could say, is a certain device which aims to put in place a kind of infinity of poetic and um, perhaps also of religious or metaphysical experience. I hope, I hope that's clear. Um, I might just say that if you want to see what, what would not be an Andavi, you could say that this Andavi form is the opposite of the Tamil or Telugu uh, Padam, the dominant uh, genre of the 18th and early 19th century uh, classical Carnatic music. A Padam is a little flash, a single unit, which is not connected to any other such unit. And it captures a particular moment, which is always singular and unique. And then it's over. So that's, I think you could say, the opposite of an andavi, which goes on forever. But there's more to say about it. The linking device, the ending, which turns into a beginning, that device um, is, um, I'm going to call it a non-mechanical repetition. See, it looks like it's a repetition. We have a phoneme, or we have um, a phrase or a word, which is repeated um, at the beginning of the following verse. But first of all, you should know that repetition is almost never a mechanical thing. We call it a repetition, which means that one is kind of uh, uh, repeating an earlier experience or an earlier form or something like that. But in fact, every time, especially in literary text or musical text, every time there is what looks like a re uh, repetition, it's really a kind of new beginning. But that new beginning contains within itself the um, resonances that were there in the previous appearance of that same segment of text. So what that means, I'll, let's, we'll take an example. I hope that you can understand what I'm saying. Think of it in terms of a Carnatic um, Raga, for example, where there's a lot of what looks like repetition, and yet the repetition is never mechanical. It's always something new. It always come, comes along with the resonance um, or the suggestions or the associations that are present in the first appearance of that same phrase. Um, what that means is there's a kind of semantic overload in the Andavi linkage. So let's take an example. I'll show you what I mean. Here is what is perhaps the first Andavi um, uh, as such as a literary genre or literary form in Tamil. Uh, we have some older examples from Sangam poetry, but they're not a full-scale text and they're not a genre. But the Adbuda Tiruvandavi of Kare Kalamayar, um, which is, we think, perhaps from this seventh century AD, it's uh, possible that this is the first full-fledged andadi that we have. And let's look at the first two verses. Okay. Um, I'll um, try to recite uh, the first verse. Many of you will know this poem very well. You can also see it inscribed uh, completely on uh, temple walls. Um, uh, for example, in the Mailapur temple, if you ever go to see the Karakalamaya shrine, which is in the temple. We'll begin with the very first verse, Kam Karakalamaya. Um, I suppose you know her story. It's a very dramatic story. Let me just say that um, according to the tradition, as we find it in the Periya Puranam, uh, she begged um, Lord Shiva to take away all these soft parts of her body, that is her skin, her blood vessels, everything that was not some kind of hard um, substance like bones, and it left her as a skeleton, which is how we find her uh, in the iconography. She is playing the symbols as uh, Shiva Nataraja is dancing. So here's the Adbuta Tiruvandavi, the first verse, the Andavi of Wonder. She begins by saying, Pirande Mori Paindrapin. Nilam kadal sirande ninse varie serndeen nirantiharum manyandra kandat vanor perumane nyanandra tirpa viral nyanandra tirpa viral. She begins pirande. No sooner was I born, no sooner did I learn to speak. Then yearning overcame me, and I came to your golden feet. O great God of all gods, with your luminous black neck, 
how soon will sorrow cease? You should notice, by the way, in this beautiful verse, Yanyantra Tirpadidar, very typical of the, the early Tamil Bhakti poets, how soon will sorrow cease? She doesn't mean, is it going to come to an end in an hour um, or two hours or a week or a month or a year? She wants it to happen immediately, right now. How soon will sorrow cease? The idar, that sorrow is unbearable. It has to end immediately. That's this yearning for an end to sorrow. But there's something a little more complex about it. Let's move on to the second verse. Uh, Nalina, can you uh, scroll down? Yeah, okay. So look at the second verse, which begins with the same word, idar. That's what makes it an andavi, idar. And here's the verse. She says, idar kalayare nun. So idar, and again idar, sorrow, even if he doesn't put an end to sorrow, even if he has no pity for us, even if he won't create for us a good path, in my heart, love never fails for our Lord who dances with fire, always draped in bones. You see that avarke for him at the end. And avarke leads us into the beginning of the next verse, verse three, avarke yerupira pumalavon, avarke, avarke, avarke. You can see the andavi. And if you go to the end of the Adbuddha Tiruvandavi, you get to Verse 101, which ends, Perade Kadal Pirande, unfailing yearning is born. And that Pirande, you'll remember, is the first word of the first verse. So we're in that circular system. But let's go back for a moment to the sorrow. When will sorrow cease? Yenandrim Tirpadidar. Idar Kalayarenum. You see, there's something about the repetition which um, brings with it more than what the word alone might mean. It's as if um, the poet, the poetess were saying to us, sorrow, when will sorrow cease? Sorrow, and again sorrow, and more and more sorrow. We begin to feel the agony which overloads the word itself. And um, there's another element here, which I think I should mention, which is the, the prayer or the hope or the yearning that the sorrow, the pain of loving, it's the pain of loving in absence because the God is both there and not there. That pain is actually something that the Tamil poets usually don't want to put an end to. They pray to the God to put an end to the pain, but really um, they want it to go on forever. And that's what they often tell us. I don't want moksha, I don't want really some kind of release. I want to be born again and again, pirande, 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 like in the Andavi, want to be, going, to be born again and again in order to feel this excruciating and yet at the same time exhilarating pain of loving this absent God, because the pain is what gives meaning and substance to our lives. Okay, um, that's a very simple example, and the Advaita Tirubandadi is a relatively simple text, which some of you I'm sure already know. You can see how it works. Again, I want to say this is a mechanism which allows for a kind of sustained, indeed perhaps infinite, immersion in the words of the text and the sounds of the text, as we'll see in a moment. And it also uh, is based upon what I've called non-mechanical repetition. On the contrary, it's a kind of heavily meaningful repetition. Repetition, and so far as we can even use the term, is here completely um, submerged in the, um, in the meaning and the substance and the feeling um, of what the poet is trying to say. Okay, um, let's move down, um, please scroll down. And yeah, we'll take just a moment we can't talk about the uh, Andadi in Tamil without mentioning the Tiruvaimuri. Uh, Namarva's Tiruvaimuri, probably from the eighth century. This is, I suppose, all of you know, is the central text 
of the uh, Narayana Divya Prabandham, that is to say, the Sri Vaishnava Tamar Canon or the Sri Vaishnava Tamar Veda. So the Tiruvaimori, which is a little over a thousand verses, is uh, one of the great Andadas. It begins, I'm not giving you the Tamil here because I want to save time for the uh, Kalvalai text. Um, many of you will know the opening verses. It begins, we are vada, we are nalam. Here's how um, Archana Venkatesan has translated that first verse, the very first verse of the Tiruvaimori. And she's uh, translated it beautifully. Who possesses the highest good? Him. Who cuts delusion? Grants a clear mind? Him. Who's the master of unforgetting, untiring immortals? Him. Sunder grief, worship his luminous feet, bow down, rise up, my mind. So, Uyarvara Uyaranalam, who possesses the highest good, the, the good than which there is nothing higher. And if we go to the very end of the Tirumalai Verse 10, 10, 11, and then the poet says, calling on Hari, who ends desire, who engulfs I am, Aram, engulfs all, Sadagopan of Kurugur, that is Namarvar, who cut desire and found release, ended the thousand flawless Andadi verse with these 10 that cut desire. Those who know them will earn a birth most high. Most high. We are in Dar in the Tamil. So we began a thousand verses earlier with we are Vara, we are in Alam, and we end with we are in Dar. That's the Andadi. And as you can see, Namarva is happy to use the word. He says the thousand flawless Andadi verse which conclude with this final padigam, these 10, that cut desire. And you'll notice that ending desire and cutting desire, and again cutting desire, um, they occur three times in this verse. I want you to keep that in mind as we move on to the text of the Kalbalai and Dali. Okay, I hope that you're still with me. I can't actually see any of you, but I'm assuming that you're there somewhere. Um, can I just um, ask, uh, Nalina, is my voice coming through clearly? Can everybody hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. All right. Now, before, um, before we get into the actual text of the Kalvalayandavi, I have to say something um, about the uh, later, um, that is the high medieval or late medieval or early modern Andavis including, I'm sure, the one that you mentioned, Nalina, uh, was published in Singapore. Um, there's a difference between the early Andadis and the later ones. Actually, there's more than one difference, but there's one very salient difference. And that is that the later Andadis, of which there are many dozens and perhaps even hundreds, because it was an extremely popular form or genre in Tamil throughout all of these centuries. And these later, early modern um, Andadis, Normally, we find uh, what I am going to call compounded figuration. That is to say, we don't have only the uh, andadi linkage that we've just looked at, the ending syllables that become the opening syllables of the next verse. We have that in every andadi, of course. But we also invariably find additional um, figures of sound or perhaps of sense. I'll be talking about figures of sound and sense, that is to say, arctalankaras or uh, shabdalankaras, if we want to use the vocabulary of the Sanskrit alankara shastra. So there are figures that are primarily phonic or sonic or sonar, that is, figures of sound, like the andadi itself. And there are figures that are primarily um, suffused by a kind of discrete meaningfulness. Those are the Arta Alankaras. 
In the late, um, the late Andades, we will almost invariably uh, find figuration of this complex type. And in fact, the text that I've chosen, and I'll explain to you in a moment why I've chosen it, the text that I've chosen is particularly rich in the figure of sound, the ornament of sound, which is called madaki or yamaka in Sanskrit. Yamaka means twinning. Madaka means literally folding or enfolding, folding and folding into, folding within. Madaka, um, what it actually means in a technical sense, uh, as we see it defined, for example, in the uh, Tandyalangaram or actually any of the later Tamil grammars, Madaka means that you have a set of syllables, a phonic or phonetic sequence, which repeats itself several times within a single verse, but each time in a different meaning. So um, you'll see in a moment what that means. We also have figures that are related to Madaka, like Tiribe, where we have a repetition of this same sort, that is to say, uh, phonetic sequence, um, which repeats itself usually in each of the four lines of a, of a poem. Uh, but with one syllable that changes from time to time. We have that also in the Kalvalayandavi in the opening verses, the um, benedictory verses. We're not going to have time to look at them today. Um, I'll, uh, I'll show you what this means in just a second. Let me say something about the poet. Um, as Nalina said, we were talking about a poet. Um, his name is Vilavaraya Sinatambi Puravar. He lived from 1716 till about 1780 in Jaffna. Um, I have to say something about what I like to call the Jaffna moment. So he belongs to the early 18th century. Uh, he was not alone. He was part of a kind of literary salon, I think one might call it, a group of poets, superbly gifted poets who were composing at the same time and also intertextually referring to one another's poems. So for example, just to give you another name or two, there was a great poet called Bhavaraja Pandita, who wrote the two major works, Kavya works. One is the Sivaratri Puranam, and the other is the Ekadasi Puranam. These are marvelous works, um, uh, much longer than any of the Andadi texts that we have uh, from Jaffna. Um, he mentions, by the way, uh, Vadaraja Pandira mentions um, our poet Sinatambi in the opening verses of his text. And to give you one more name, there is a great poet called Arasa Kesari. Arasa Kesari, who um, produced a Tamil version, it's not a translation, but a kind of Tamil recreation or reimagining of Kalidasa's Raghuvansha. It's a very difficult text, a long and difficult text, and a remarkable masterpiece by any standard. I'm mentioning these, um, these authors, there are many more. Um, in order to drive home the point that something really extraordinary was happening in Jaffna in northern Sri Lanka in the um, late 17th and early 18th century. This is what I'm calling the Jaffna moment. It's not only in literature, it's also true in musical um, composition and, and the performance. You have to imagine a moment where these great poets were meeting one another, knew one another, quoting one another, um, conversing with one another, and also going to the kacheris that were taking place in the villages um, in the northern part of Sri Lanka. Um, this is also a period of very intense multilingual creativity. So I'm mentioning this just um, because I think sometimes people forget it. Um, these are poets who also knew Singhala and maybe Pali and certainly Sanskrit. It was a multilingual universe and it's not hard to show um, that these people were communicating with and conversing with in their own works um, with the kind of uh, literary um, masterpieces that were being produced in Singhala at the same time. This was the period where Tamil speaking kings, Nayaka kings were ruling um, in Kandy, farther south. Um, you know, I, I feel that it's important to say this because um, I have a kind of heavy feeling that the great literary masterpieces from Jaffna from this time have been largely forgotten. I'll tell you why I think that. Um, I was in Jaffna just before the corona 
um, Jaffa and Batikoloa and places uh, nearby. Uh, in Jaffna, I gave a lecture about the Kalvalayam Dabi. I chose it because the poet Sinatambi Pulavar had composed it exactly in the streets outside Jaffna University where I was speaking. Um, and I thought it was important to perhaps um, read a few verses with the Tamil speaking audience uh, in Jaffna. Uh, it was a large audience, about 100, maybe 120, maybe 150 people, I don't know, in a big room in Jaffna University. And before I began uh, reading the verses with them, I asked them how many of them had ever heard the name of Sinatambi Pulavar. And um, there was a kind of silence. And finally, one elderly lady raised her hand. She was the only one in that room who knew that a poet called Sinatambi Pulavar had once lived and walked on those same streets and composed um, literary works of tremendous power. Um, there are reasons, I think, that this literature has been largely forgotten. Um, everyone um, in Tamil Sri Lanka, Jaffna, actually everyone on the entire island, I think, is um, post-traumatic. Maybe not even post, they're traumatic. They have uh, somehow survived the war. And that war, I think, wiped out a lot of the awareness of the... Um, in the case of, the, of uh, Jaffna, in, um, the awareness of the great works in Tamil that had been composed in the 17th and 18th and 19th, and in fact, even early 20th century there in Jaffna. I think it, uh, I have a kind of ambition to do what I can to somehow maybe help uh, revive the awareness of these books and also um, to help people know how to, how to read them. Because um, as you'll see in a moment, Perhaps you already know, uh, to, read a, to read verses like um, Sina Tambi Pulavar's, um, uh, we'll be reading a few in just a moment. To read these verses, it's not like reading T.S. Eliot or um, any of the modern Tamil poets. You can choose whoever you want. Manushya um, Pudinan, Pasuvaya, doesn't really matter. It's not like reading modern poetry in Tamil, in English in any of the languages. This is a different poetic sensibility and one has to somehow open oneself to it. I'm not sure that you're going to like these verses, but I think you might and I like them. So uh, let me just say a word about Kalvalai. Um, Kalvalai is today called uh, Sandilipai. Sandilipai is a, a suburb of Jaffna city. It's within the um, urban uh, limits of uh, Jaffna today, but in the early 18th century, uh, Kalavalai was a small village on the outskirts of Jaffna. Um, it was famous for the Kalavalai temple, whose god is called Kalpaka Vinayaka. Kalpaka Vinayaka, that is to say, Ganapati, who um, gives all wishes, because Kalpaka is a reference to the Kalpaka Vrikshas, the Kalpaka trees in the world of the gods. As you know, the wishing trees, if you're lucky enough to go to the world of the gods, um, all you have to do is to speak your wish to the will wishing tree and it will provide it, it will answer and fulfill the wish. Kalpaka Vinayaka, in that case, is the god who fulfills his devotee's wishes. Um, so it's a well-known temple, um, well-known partly because of the Kalvalayandavi, um, our work, Sinatambi Luvar's composition, um, which you should also know was once a fundamental part of the curriculum of any Tamil education, not only in Jaffna, but in everywhere, in all places where Tamil is spoken, um, notably in South India. The Madurai Changam had a, a, a set of schools in which the Kalvalai Andavi was one of the primary texts. Um, it was a famous book. Um, maybe even today people know it in South India, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not <clears throat> very confident that it survived um, <clears throat> in, uh, in Jaffna, although <clears throat> at the end of this talk, I will have a story, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll have a story to tell you about that, just one second. <clears throat> I went to Kalvalai and I had, um, a kind of happy experience there, which I'll tell you about at the end of this lecture. 
Okay. Um, I guess that's enough by way of background. Uh, we're going to read four or five verses. Um, each one of them has its own complexity. And we're not rushing anywhere. And if we don't read all four or five of them, that's also fine. Um, let's begin with the first verse, the very first verse after the benediction verses. I'll, um, I'm going to read it to you um, in the kind of um, what we would call the viruttam style. That is to say phrase by phrase. <clears throat> I'll translate phrase by phrase. Then we'll read through the verse as a whole and we'll look at it in a literal English translation and then maybe in some slightly less literal translation. Okay, so it begins like this. Kalpaganadar, Kalpaganadar, Kalpaganadar or Kalpaganatar. They are the gods, the people who live in the Nade, where the Kalpaka trees are found, that is, in heaven. Kalpaganadar Padinsa the Kannan. So there is a god who has. A thousand eyes. Padin Sadakannan. Sada is Sanskrit Shatta. Padin Sadakannan. That's Indra. Um, you probably know that he has a thousand eyes on his body. And you probably know why he has a thousand eyes. Padin Sadam, ten, ten, ten hundreds. And that's because the sage Gautama cursed him after Indra had seduced Gautama's wife, um, Ahalya. Actually, um, the eyes were originally something else. Anyway, Indra is left with a thousand eyes. So, Kalpakanadar Padinsa the Kannan, Indra, Yen Kannan. And then there's the person who has eight eyes. Who could that possibly be? Um, because it has to be the god Brahma who has four heads two eyes in each head. Actually, um, Brahma initially had five heads and in somewhat embarrassing circumstances, he lost one of them. Now he's left with four heads. He's Nahanmugan, the four-headed God, and he has eight eyes in Kannan. Kalpakanadar padinsa the Kannan in Kannan torun Kalpaka vanji irakkannan. So Indra and Brahma, they're worshipping. Who are they worshipping? Irakannan. Well, there's kann again, the word for I, but kann here means not I, but it's a locative place marker. The person who has in the left side of his body, irakannan. You'll notice that there's a lot of eyes in this verse. So who is the person who lives in the left side of the God's body? We're talking about Lord Shiva. That must be Parvati, Uma. And she is Karpe Aham Vanji. She's a kind of a vine or creeper uh, whose innerness, Aham, or who has inside of her Karpe, that is to say feminine virtue. Notice we have Karpaka at the first opening, the first line, second line, Karpaka again, but with an entirely different meaning. That's Maraka. So, Ida Kanna, Lord Shiva. We'll go on. Ida Kannan, Rinde Mukannan. Sorry, Tan, sorry, my mistake. Tandamukkannan. And we have the three eyed God who was born to Lord Shiva. So Lord Shiva has three eyes, but Kalpaka Vinayaka in Kalvalai also has three eyes. And that's who is meant here. We have the God of the three eyes, namely Kalpaka Vinayaka, who was born to the God who has Uma in his left half, and that god is worshipped by Indra with the thousand eyes and Brahma with the eight eyes. I hope you're with me so far. 
Now, we're at the end of the second line, and we have what is called complex enjambment. That means that we have some syntactic sequence, some phrase which spills over the boundary between the end of the second line and the beginning of the third line. That's something which is not so common in early Tamil. Uh, but in this kind of work, it's very common. And what do we have? We have anvil kalbaga. So there's kalpaga again. But here, we have to decide with this. Anvil kalpaka veleri veil. We have the god who threw his spear, the veil. So we must be talking about Murugan, Lord Murugan. And he threw the spear, kalpaga, so that the stony mountain, kal, Aga was cleft in two, burst in two. And which mountain was it? It was Anvil Kalpaga. Anvil Kal, the mountain of the Anvil bird. The Anvil bird is the Kraunja bird in Sanskrit. The Kraunja bird has a mountain named after itself, Kraunja Parvata or Kraunja Giri. And you may know that Murugan actually threw his veil, he threw his spear or his lance at that mountain, at the Kraunsha mountain, splitting it open and killing the demon Taraka who was hiding from him inside the mountain. Now, how do we know that this is Kraunsha mountain? Because Tamil Andril is the Kraunsha bird in Sanskrit. So we have a kind of bilingual um, lexeme, you could say. You have to translate Andril Kal into Crown Shagiri in, in order to understand um, what the poet is saying. Okay, so we have Andril Kal Paga Vel Yeri Vel Tunaivan. Who is this Tunaivan? We must be talking about Lord Kalpaka Vinayaka. He is the companion or the friend or the brother probably the younger brother, of the god Vail, who threw his spear at the Crouncha mountain. And now we know who exactly it is, because the poet says, Kalvalai padivar kalpaka nan niram shirandar karukkarai kannavare. This tunaivan, this God who we have just defined, he's the one who lives in Kalvalai. Kalvalai Padivar Kalpaka Nan Niral. Kalpaka, we now get the name of the God. He's Kalpaka Vinayaka. And those who reach Sirandar is Nan Niral, the shade, the cool shade of his feet. Kalpaka Nan Niral Sirandar Karuk. Karai Kandavare, they have seen Kandavare, they have seen the at the further shore, Karai, of Karu. Karu means birth. Actually, it means a kind of fetus or a seed. Karu Karai, they've reached the end of the oceans of birth and seen the shore. Let's quickly read through the whole verse again. Kalpagana Rarpadinja the Kanan, Yen Kanan Turun, Kalpakavanji, Irakanan Tanda, Mukanan, Anvil Kalpaka Veleri Vail Tunevan, Kalvalai Padivar, Kalpakanan, Yarashirandar, Karukarai Kandavare. So, in a literal English, it's something like this. He's the one worshipped by the gods who live near the wishing trees in heaven, by Indra of the thousand eyes, and eight-eyed Brahma. He's the three-eyed son of the god with the vine-like lady of virtue in the left side of his body. He's the companion of the god, Dev, who threw his spear and cleft open Mount Krauncha, that is Murugan. Those who find shelter in the shade of Kalpaka Vinayaka, who lives in Kalvalai, have seen the farther shore of the ocean of births. Let's um, scroll down, please. OK. 
Okay. So actually we've already um, decoded the um, mother kit because uh, you've seen um, how Karpaka Nara and Karpaham and Karpaga and then Kalpaka Vinayaka, they all repeat the same um, sound sequence, but with different meanings. And that's what Madhika is all about. It's about harmoniums, that is uh, um, sounds that uh, look phonetically as if they're identical, but that have different meanings because of Sandhi, because of resegmentation, because of complex enjambment, because of lexical displacement, Tamil to Sanskrit to Tamil, uh, other forms of encoding. We don't need to extend the list, but you can see how it works. If we wanted to try to preserve something of the sound and the experience of the Tamil in English, which actually is impossible, but we wanted to, well, here's a kind of playful attempt to translate this verse, not quite so literally. The gods serve him. Even Brahma, even Indra never swerve from him. Murugan is his friend who with verve cast his spear at that rocky mountain. Those who come to be with him in Kalavalai will surely find the cool freedom they deserve. You can hear the Madaka in a way, but actually it's a long ways from the beauty of the Tamil where the Madaka is very precise and you get always the same syllables exactly. If we wanted to turn this English verse into an Andavi, then I thought we could start the next verse in English with the word preserve, the cool freedom they deserve, and now preserve his beauty in your heart or something like that. Okay, um, there are a few things I'd be happy to say about this verse um, without um, stretching your patience too much. And I want to go on um, and read another couple of verses at least. But you might notice how this poem begins in, in heaven and the gods, with the gods, and ends up in Kalvalai. So there's kind of vertical axis from the heaven of the gods down to Kalvalai, but actually Kalvalai turns out to be superior in all important ways to the heaven of the gods. In fact, who would want to go to the heaven of the gods if you could go to Kalvalai? Let's go on to the next verse. We'll see another um, version of this same idea. Okay, so you remember the first verse ended with Kandavare. Verse two begins with Kandal, Ka. All you need is that symbol, that is that syllable Ka in order to um, uh, fulfill the requirements of the Andadi. Here's a verse which in a way is a bit in the old uh, Sangam poetry style. Let's go through it. Kandalam podai purlinam yendron de kangam padungi. Kangam, it's a hawk or an eagle. Let's call it a hawk. There's a hawk who is orned. He thinks that the buds of the kandal tree, kandal is what is usually called in Tamil tarai or tara. Taraimaram, that is the screw pine, pandanus. Kandalam podai pulinam yendru onde. This hawk is looking at the buds of the pandanus tree, which are white, and he thinks that they're birds, pulinam. White birds, maybe herons or egrets or something like that. And thinking that, the hawk, Padungi, he's lying in wait, presumably because he'd like to attack them, Padungi. And then, Kande, you see the Madake, Kandal, now Kandalamande, Kande, but then he looks at them, Alamande, and he's a little bit confused, the hawk, that is. And what does he do in his confusion? That is, he looks at these Bodhi, these these buds, and he begins to realize that he's made a mistake and that they're not birds, but the buds of the um, screw pine. 
And so Alamanda, he's confused. And what does he do? Sirigatrum, he flaps his wings. Kalvalai Kalpaka, Sirigatrum Kalvalai Kalpaka. This is a Sambodhana address to the God whom we've already met. That is to say, Kalpaka Vinayaka in Kalvalai. So I'll read the English um, of this beginning. God in Kalvalai, where the hawk lies in wait, thinking the pandanus blossoms are some kind of birds, but looking more closely confused, he flaps his wings. Oh, this is what happens in Kalvalai. Now, in Kandala Mundrum, in Padamum, Kana, in order to see your three eyes, remember I told you that Kalpaka Vinayaka has three eyes, in order to see your golden feet, what kind of feet are they? They're yenayal pol padam. They're golden feet which have taken over my life, that rule me. In order to see them, vina kandalan pol kanpadaitilan vasa kamalatami. In order to see them, for some reason, Vasa Kamalaktane, that is Brahma again, the creator, he's the one who sits on a lotus, a fragrant lotus, lives on the lotus. He, for some reason, Mina Kandalan Pol, Kanpadaitiran, he didn't create for me eyes like the eyes of Indra. You remember from the previous verse, he has a thousand eyes. So the poet is saying, I wish I had a thousand eyes to contemplate Kalpaka Vinayaka in Kalvalai. For some strange reason, Brahma didn't give me a thousand eyes. Here's the English verse. God in Kalvalai, where the hawk lies in wait, thinking the pandanus blossoms are some kind of birds, but looking more closely, confused, he flaps his wings. For some reason, the creator, Brahma, didn't give me eyes like Indra's to see your eyes, your three eyes and the golden feet that have taken over my life. Um, so we have, we have the Andadi mechanism <clears throat> and we have Madhaka, again, the same, phonetic sequence, but each time in a different meaning. Look at the final sequence, <clears throat> Vina Kandalan. Ha Kandala is a name for Indra. So again, we have um, the third line spilling over syntactically into the fourth line. And it's a kind of beautiful tour de force. And um, along with this Madhaka, actually we, I'm not going to go into it, but there's a kind of Tiruba here. And we have another figure which would be called in, um, in Tamil, would be called Mayakani. In uh, Sanskrit, it's called Brantimat, which is mis misperception because we have this hawk. You know, we have this hawk who's looking at the flowers and he's uh, mistaking them for birds, white birds. And in the course of the poem, he is somehow disabused of his misperception. But that misperception always takes the form of somebody outside the poem, let us say the poet himself, or the listener or the reader, who understands that the hawk is making a cognitive mistake, and then um, finds it somewhat amusing, or maybe perhaps appalling. And it kind of makes you wonder, because in Tamil poetry, from the Sangam period on, if we have a description of something in the external Puram landscape, the outside landscape, the natural landscape, you have something going on there, it is meant to mirror, usually in some very resonant and precise way, what is happening inside the mind of somebody, the speaker or the friend of the speaker or the subject. It makes you wonder if the confusion, Branti, that the Kangam is suffering from is not also somehow felt by the reader when he faces or she faces this semantic overload um, that I mentioned earlier. That is to say, the Andavi plus Nimadaka. 
And also, this seems to be a verse about seeing. Like the previous verse, remember how many eyes were there in the previous verse? This is about seeing. Lord Brahma did not give me enough eyes in order to see you, your golden feet, and your three eyes. And there's something about seeing, which is a really basic and recurrent, recursive theme in, in uh, the Kalvalayandavi. Actually, it's prevalent in all of the literature of this period because um, you see how the sound is very important. The sounds that actually come into your ears and take a little while to understand have to be decoded. But actually, um, in Tamil poetry from this early modern period, you're also meant to be able to see the sounds. There's a synesthetic element. Sounds are something we hear. They're very important here. In fact, maybe they're more important than the actual meaning, literal meaning of the words, as you'll see in a moment. But um, it's also the case that sound is something that can be seen or should be seen, should be visualized. And although I don't have time to speak about it here, that is one of the fundamental building blocks of Carnatic music in the high period of the late 18th and 19th century. One should be able to see or visualize or oralize, A-U-R-E-L, oralize um, what the poet or the musician is singing about. Um, so here's a poet who says, what is he telling us? I can't see the way Indra sees, but I can see the music of this Tamil poem. I can see the sound. I can see it in my mind's eye. And seeing it does something to me. Let's go on and read another verse, okay? Look at Kamalatane the final word of uh, this verse. And let's see how the third verse goes. Um, do you want to scroll down, please? Yeah. Okay, this is an unusual verse. There's the ka, kamalatane ka. Um, this is a relatively simple verse, although maybe not at first reading. In general, um, reading um, these Andavi poems, uh, usually, as I said before, they have a riddle-like quality so that at first hearing you don't fully understand them and you have to decode them. But once you have decoded them, suddenly they become very simple and obvious. It's a kind of um, alchemical transmutation. So let's look at this first. The idea is very simple. Kavanna rambayan surumbu virumbu karun kural poga vana rambay kulam potida. That's the first clause. Arambai. Arambai are the Apsaras women in the world of the gods. They're the most beautiful women in the universe. And what kind of women are they? Well, they're Poga Van Arambai. They're the Apsarasas who live in heaven and who provide Poga, Poga, pleasure. And they have Kavanarambai. They have thighs that are tapering like the stalks of the Kadali plant, the, um, the banana plant. Not like the banana fruit. Beautiful women don't have thighs that look like bananas. They have thighs that look like the banana plant. If you've seen the plant growing uh, in real life, you'll know why the poets have chosen to say this. Kavanarambai. They have these beautiful tapering thighs. And they also have They have dark hair where um, bees are buzzing. Their hair, hair is beloved of the bees. So these women, Putrida, while they're praising or singing songs of praise, Vardal Kannen, Vardal Kannen, there's a life. Where is that life? Well, apparently in heaven. Van. Van Varda, living in heaven. And we could, use, we could also take the Poga, Poga, and attach it to Varda. Poga Van Varda, that is living a life of pleasure in the heaven of the gods while these beautiful women are singing. And now the central crux of this verse, Kanen. 
I don't see it. That means I don't see the purpose of it. Of who would want it? I don't want it. The commentators on this verse say, Kanin, Karudain. I don't even want to think about it. I don't want to live in heaven. Ini Sangavanaram Panga Veli Kani Sindurum Kalvalai Pungava. It's another vocative Sambodhana. Oh Pungava, oh you, great God of Kavalai, of Kalvalai. So what is Kalvalai? It's a place where Sangavanaram, where flocks of um, or herds of monkeys, Vanaram, Pangadai Kani Sindirum, they're tossing ripe banana fruits into the air. Why are they doing that? I'm not exactly sure. Maybe monkeys like to throw bananas into the sky. Or maybe there's another reason. We'll come back to it in a second. But that's Kalavala. At least we know there are a lot of banana trees or plants there. And still, that's the case, actually, I can tell you. So you who are living in Kalavala, and you are the beloved son of Uma, whose words are as sweet as the Yar, as the Vina. And if we look at the whole verse in English, I'm a little reluctant to do this because the Tamil is so beautiful and the English is so plain. But still, let's look at it. The pleasure women of the gods, their thighs tapering like the stalks of plantain, bees buzzing in their dark hair, are surely singing songs of praise. But I care nothing for that life of pleasure in the skies, O Lord in Kalvalai, where herds of monkeys throw ripe bananas in the air, O son of Uma, whose every word is melody. And so once again, I think by now you're perhaps getting used to the idea that um, we're talking about a poetic composition, which is a kind of music. And the sounds of it, in a way, override the meanings of the words. Um, just a thought about the monkeys and the bananas. I think it's possible that we have a bilingual pun here. So he's chosen the word vanaram, and he needed that because kavan, kavan, kavanaram, sangavanaram. But vanaram in, in Tamil would be um, no, kurangi, but it could also be kavi, Sanskrit kapi. And it could be that when he says sangavanaram, he's thinking of Sanskrit kapi, Tamil kavi, which also means a poet. And maybe he's thinking of poets who are throwing their verses into the sky, including the poets that he was writing for and with and, um, in the early 18th century in Jaffa. I don't know. Those kinds of uh, playful games are part of the Andavi, um, Andavi mode. Um, Nalina, we have, do we have time to read at least one more verse? Yes, we could do one. We'll do one more, okay. So I think um, I think let's um, move to the next one, verse four. Um, I particularly like this verse for a reason that you'll see in a moment, okay? So begin at the beginning. Tenan. We have three things in the beginning, three ideas, three elements. Tenan, which is Sanskrit, the dana, money. Wealth. Now, Tanantandi Marupana Madar. Madar, women whose breasts, Tanan, are like the tusk of an elephant. It's a standard way of talking about women's breasts in Tamil, also in Sanskrit, by the way. So we have money, we have women, beautiful women, and we have Tarai, the earth land. Tanan tananta ni maruppana madar tarai virumbudal nanda. Nanda means to be extinguished. So in order for the desire virumbudal 
for these three things, money, land, and women, in order for that desire to be extinguished, at every ghat, at every turai, every kul turai, going down to the ocean or the river, which is um, where there are plenty of um, conch shells, nandam, men sanjarikan tanam tanam tantimiyen kalvalayan sangakurai kadal, kadal, Think with your heart about the sun, Nandan, the son of the Sangha Kurai Kadan, that is the Lord who has Kanch a little ornament of kanch, a kanch kura in his ear. That son of the Lord who has that kanch, Lord Shiva, he's in, he's in Kalvalai, as we know. And in Kalvalai, men sancharikan tanantanandandimi. You can hear the bees buzzing. And how are they buzzing? Tanantanandandimi, that's what you hear. And that... God in Kalvalai, he's tandam ondram, tandam ondram. He has a single tusk. Indra, the Indra goes with the tanantanandandimi. Think about him. Let's read it in English. To extinguish your desire for money, for land, and for women, their breasts like an elephant's tusk, think always in your heart of the son of Lord Shiva with his earring of conch. Think of his single tusk. This Lord of Kalvalai, whereas you go down to the sea, rich with shells, bees gently hum. You can hear them now. That's what it sounds like in Kalvalai. So you remember I said to you earlier that the sound is something that one really ought to be able to see in a verse like this. And it also um, comes through in this powerful musical way, um, which we hear in the musical notes. We can actually hear what the bees are singing. It's not something the poet describes. It's what we actually hear. Um, I'm going to conclude by reading um, to you, if I may, a short paragraph that I wrote about this verse. Because the question is, what is the poet trying to tell us? And you can see it's a complex verse, like all of these Andavi verses. So if I were going to paraphrase it, I could say something like, Kalvalai is throbbing or humming with music, a natural music with its own natural rhythms that one can hear whenever one goes down to the sea. And it is also resonant with the internal rhythms of this God and the movement that animates his every moment. Well, that's a paraphrase. And like any paraphrase, it destroys the actual expressive content that it is trying to represent. But you could say that this musical reality is so strong and also perhaps so subtle that it drowns out all of our usual obsessions and cravings. And so instead of think or think of in the translation I've given, it might be better to say something like this. Listen, hear that music, attune your ears to it, because if you take its rhythm into your body, it will save your life. And I think to put it in those terms is to get a little closer to what that verse actually means. Um, if we think of meaning in a wide sense or a deeper sense. So let me tell you in closing what happened to me when I went to Kalvalai. So because of Sinatami Pulavar, I wanted to see the temple. I wanted to see Kalvalai. Uh, I was with friends. We took a auto rickshaw um, from the university campus in Jaffna. And we went to Sandilipai. 
a great um, catastrophe happened in Sandalipai. Some of you may know there was a massacre of Tamil civilians there during the war, the early stages of the war. Um, anyway, uh, we went to Sandalipai and we started asking people where the temple was and they eventually directed us. It took a while, but we finally found it. And it was very clear that this was the temple that we needed because there's a picture there, a statue of our poet Sinatambi singing his poems to the god, Kalpaka Vinayaka. Actually, there are two statues, one on the Gopuram and one outside in a particular tableau. But I was thrilled to see the temple. It's a beautiful small temple, um, but it was locked naturally because uh, you know that's what happens. And uh, they said, well, the caretaker who has the key, he should be back soon. Just wait a little while. He's gone off on some errand, so we waited. And while we were waiting, I started singing these verses, the same verses that you've heard me sing or recite um, now, although I sing them in a sort of extended Viruttam style. It was just to pass the time or somehow, I don't know, I had the impulse to sing them there at the temple. And the caretaker arrived. He was riding his bicycle. He arrived and he saw this very kind of peculiar uh, vision. He saw this person who was clearly not from Jaffna or not from South Asia at all, some person from somewhere else whom he didn't know. And he was uh, sitting there singing these verses from the Kalbalaya and Davi. And he was completely overcome. And he came over and embraced me. And he was in tears. And he cried and he cried. And then he said to me, he said, you know, these verses, they saved our lives. Because during the war, when there was heavy shelling, in Jaffna, people took refuge in the temples. He knew the verses because he sings them. He's perhaps the last person in Kalvalai or in Jaffna who knows the whole Kalvalai and Dadi by heart. He sings them on Shivaratri night. And he said, uh, knowing these verses, hearing them coming out of my mouth, he said, you know, during the war, uh, people took shelter in this temple and that's how we survived. And he said, these verses, they saved our lives. So you can see that Andadi, um, it has its own beauty and its own challenges. And maybe it goes beyond that and can produce other real effects in our world. I'll stop here and thank you. And I hope you were able to follow what I was trying to say. Thank you, Dr. Shulman. I think um, what I really enjoyed about your presentation is while we went through all of the, you know, um, technicalities of the translation of the Kalbalaya and Dadi, I think what was fascinating is that you also managed to capture the author of it, um, you know, and I think um, a friend of mine, I think, was attending this evening, Suresh, uh, Kumar and I, we were actually looking at the Kandishas Dikam some, some time back, and then we ah. realized that there was so little information about Devaraya Swamigal and, you know, yeah. all of the forgotten poets. So I thought that was really fascinating. Um, I'm going to open the floor now for questions. Um, we have some time, so please introduce yourselves. Feel free to turn on your videos and uh, so uh, Dr. Shulman can see you and, um, you know, share your comment or question. I see Mr. Yeah. Arun has his video on. Um, would you like to ask a question, Mr. Arun? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> thank you uh, for giving me the honor. It, it is uh, a great, great pleasure for me to listen to Dr. David Shulman. <clears throat> I have read him. I've read his uh, book on uh, Tamil uh, the biography. Uh, but it's the first time that I have actually seen him address a Singapore audience. And I want to thank you, Nalina, uh, for making this possible. I also am very upset that you beat me to him. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> That's another story. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by your discourse, uh, Professor Shulman. As an outsider, and I, I don't mean this with any any disrespect, it, but at the end of the day, I am a native Tamil uh, and, and a Tamil speaker and a Tamil student. Uh, you, it, English to me is what Tamil is to you in a way. Do you find that poetry like this, which some people would say is wordplay, 
does it occur to you at all in this Andadi style that they are laboring words, laboring uh, grammar, uh, just to get it into the format? Or do you feel that this is actually coming from a wellspring of genuine um, you know, feeling, genuine emotion? What, what, what do you feel uh, as, a, as a reader of Tamil? Because I would enjoy even a third grade Tamil poem because of the beauty of the words, you know? Yeah. Uh, just like so many of the movie songs, right? But what yeah. do you feel? So that's a very important question. I'm very glad you asked it. Um, uh, let me say uh, two things. First of all, I think the second of the two options you uh, offered me uh, is the correct one. That is to say, I think these are poems that although they look as if they are, in, let's sort of say, um, encrusted with all kinds of um, word plays and uh, formal devices and so on, um, these are poems that um, I think are absolutely um, rich in, in feeling, in strong emotion and in beauty and in expressive power. Um, I think the poets like Sinatambi Purava, I don't think they had to work very hard actually to produce the Madaka and Andavi and Tiribu and all of those things. I don't think it was difficult for them at all. It was very natural for them. It's not right to think of them sort of scratching their heads and saying, well, what word would possibly fit into an I mean, it's not like that. They had no problem at all in doing it. Um, but they were using these forms because of the complexity and because of the, I think, because of the uh, musicality that is built into the person. And as you said about your own um, ear and feeling, um, you know, um, it speaks to you. It speaks, I think, to anybody who knows Tamil. If they're beautifully recited or sung, you can't help but feel the musicality. of it. So I think, um, let me put it like this. There's a tendency, I think, all of us have had this, um, you know, there's a tendency for people to think that the poetry of the last, I don't know, 500 or 800 years in Tamil is um, not as good and not as immediate and not as uh, kind of powerful and expressive as the very old poems of the Sangam anthologies or of the Tevaram or the um, Tiruvaimuri or whatever. There's a tendency to say that these were poets who were involved in some kind of um, I don't know, artificial word game, some artificial game. Uh, and the poetry is therefore not as um, expressive and eloquent. But I think that's a colonial um, inheritance. We've gotten this from the people, uh, mostly colonial scholars or colonial period scholars, some of them from Europe and some of them who absorbed that sensibility in 19th century Chennai or in 20th century Chennai, I don't know. And um, they somehow came to this, um, this viewpoint that this is this poetry is kind of um, forbidding, you might say, and indeed it requires a bit of effort because there's an element of decoding, in, in the, as, as, as we could see. You know, but I think it's wrong to think of it like that. I think these are poems that are absolutely um, saturated with beauty and um, expressive powers and interesting ideas and unusual connections, and also with the intertextual resonances of the entire history of Tamil, 2000 years of Tamil are all present in these verses in the Kalvalayanda. And I think that's a great achievement. So I, I you know, I, whenever I speak about verses like this, including to my students in Jerusalem, <laughs> I try to help them to, um, you know, begin to feel the particular power and the joy that one gets from reading these verses. You know? yeah. Thank you. Shulman, I am Dr. Sinnapan. Actually, there is a Jnana Samandar of the sixth century as a introduced some of the poems like Madaki in his Tevaram uh, yes. uh, songs. Therefore, uh, from previous, previously, we cannot find uh, these kind of poems in the earlier mm. literature. Only yeah. from Jnana Samandar, we have find these Madaki and so many things. Therefore, uh, as uh, our Magalan said, very difficult to understand. If you want to understand these poems, we have got mm. a lot of knowledge, grammar, morphophonics, and so many things, meaning yes. the words. Therefore, uh, nowadays, the people think uh, it's not a good poem. 
we cannot enjoy the poetry uh, then only we have to that is a modern approach uh, do, do you agree with that so um, first of all um, it's absolutely correct what you said that uh, tirunyana sambandra has these devices not only madaka he has the whole range yeah, of yeah. The shabbas, you know it's all there and it's especially in the um, the munnam tirunai the third volume of the tevaram of the tirunyana sambandra is completely filled with these kinds of uh, things um, he um, i don't think he invented them he was somehow uh, familiar with practices that must have already been possible in the Tamil country at that time. We also see these devices in the um, Sri Vaishnava Tamil, you know, Tamil Marai. So, but he's, he's the first um, to use them, you could say, in a kind of systematic way. Uh, there's a profusion of these, of these devices. Um, like the Kalvayandadi, they require decoding. It's not something that you understand at first hearing. Once you take the effort to decode them, um, I think they become very transparent. That's one of these kind of strange things that uh, sort of unexpected experiences because when you first hear them, or maybe, maybe even when the, the first two or three times that you hear them, you don't understand them. But yes. on the fourth time, especially yes. if you invest a little effort in it, you will understand them. And once you've understood them, suddenly you're aware of how beautiful and economical uh, and eloquent they are. Um, very much like in the later uh, Andalis. I think everybody would agree. I, I assume everybody would agree. Tamil speakers, Tamil readers would agree that the Tevaram poems, if you hear them from the mouths of the Oduval, um, they always sound beautiful, even if you don't understand them. But if you do understand them, if you, if you are capable of taking the time and decoding those Sambandar um, verses, then you get a kind of added value. And um, I think, um, you know, uh, the Wodhuva themselves, they may not, they may not always themselves understand what they're singing in a kind of a precise you way. Yeah, well, some, there are some, you know, there are some who are very well trained in Tamil scholarship. I've met such people, but, but um, many of them, I'm sure they don't, but they do have the music. Um, yes. in the puns as they sing them today, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think when we hear them, uh, they're moving no matter what, even if you don't have a full understanding of the text. But uh, as, um, as you suggested, I think, um, if you do manage to decode uh, the Alankara devices, then uh, you see an added beauty a really uh, a remarkable thing. And that's one of the great things about Tamil poetry. Exactly that combination, the inherent musicality of it uh, and the amazing wordplay and uh, word sound play, really, these, uh, these uh, phonic uh, effects, together with the very subtle and sometimes uh, truly remarkable, amazing original thoughts that are somehow embedded in those sounds. The second part of the Dandi Alangaram, I spoken about Solani, they yes. have given the grammar about the, the things. Yeah. And then another right. thing, actually, the, even the Nana Samantha's poem, the titles show the influence of Sanskrit, Yamagam, Siri yes. Irisku Kural, like that. Yes, All yes. these influence of Sanskrit. That's so, true. Absolutely right. Yes, uh, Daniel and Karan, so that's, of course, much later. We think that the Daniel and Karan, the Tamil Daniel and Karan, it's yes. perhaps a 12th, 12th century book. There are good reasons to think that. Uh, it comes more or less from the same time as the Vila Soriam. So we're much later than Sambandar, maybe 500 years later. And he um, he does give definitions of the various types of Madaki, indeed of all these Solanias. So just as you said, that's true. If you want to understand how these ornaments are seen in the classical period, we have the Tandi Alangaram uh, as a very um, kind of powerful um, grammar, you could say, of these, uh, of the, of these for devices. For information, in Singapore, there was a poem, Singe uh, Nagar Andadi, and Sitara uh, Kavigal, hmm. composed by Alpanam Sadasiva Pandu. In the second part of Chitra Gavi, we are able to find 16 types of these. Within yeah. one song, there are three verses, three, 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 and three Vandari, like that. Therefore, yeah, yeah. this for your information, please. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to say, uh, you, you're also correct in saying that there are 
Um, there are Sanskrit elements in the Tirunyana Sambandha Tevaram for sure. There's no question. And I myself, I mean, if you've looked at my book, I guess you know that I don't think that the, there is a severe disjuncture or even opposition between Sanskrit and Tamil. I think the, this was a bilingual world and they really belong together. There's no point in trying to somehow purify Tamil by uh, taking Sanskrit out of it. It's not, not a good idea. For someone that it was very natural, I think, to have the awareness he must have had of uh, Sanskrit uh, poetic devices you know, and Sanskrit language. Dr. Shulman, there's a question in the chat window, um, and oh. it's from Suresh Kumar Mutakumaran, who is an ancient historian and who has a deep interest in South Asia. Um, thank yeah. you for the stimulating lecture, Dr. Shulman. What are the historical circumstances behind the literary effervescence you term the Jaffna moment? Also, do we know if 17th or 18th century Jaffna poets interacted with contemporary mainland poets? Yeah. Uh, okay, let me be, um, begin with the second question. I'll come back to the question of why this happened, because, you know, why questions for historians, they're always a problem. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in history, and I can tell you I was never fully satisfied by the causal explanations that my teachers gave me for all kinds of historical uh, processes. You know, I was never really satisfied by that. But let me answer the second thing first. Yeah, um, it's very important to know about... Um, the Jaffna Tamil poets that um, in the 17th, 18th century, Jaffna was very much a part of the uh, South Indian cultural world. You know, um, the Palk Strait, uh, it's very easily navigated uh, and there were boats going back and forth all the time. Um, also in the period that we're talking about, especially once the English had established their uh, dominion over Sri Lanka. So we were talking about two uh, British colonies and it was, it was a very ordinary thing for uh, let us say a Jaffna poet like Sinatambi, like Vadaraja Pandita, to uh, cross the state, uh, uh, the straits, and to go um, and interact with his uh, colleagues and friends, fellow poets and uh, devotees and so on in the, the Tamil country. They did it all the time. Um, in fact, um, the um, the Sivaratri Puranam, which I mentioned earlier, it was commissioned by from this Jaffna poet Vadarasa. Um, by uh, these uh, Brahmins in uh, Tilla in Chidambaram. Uh, he tells us at the opening of his book, he said, please write a book for us about the Shivanatri Puranam, which he did, and I and we did in Jaffna, and I don't know where the Arangetram took place, but probably it took place somewhere in South India. He has another, our, our poet, by the way, um, uh, Sinatambi Purvar, he has another Andavi called the Marai Sai, and uh, the, on Vedaranyam, that is Tirumare Kade. So you could see, I mean, there was no problem for him to go to Vedaranyam and compose a poem, a hundred verse uh, Andadi, which was probably initially recited, the Arangate, so in the temple of, uh, of uh, Marekada, that's uh, Vedaranyam. So there was tremendous uh, uh, movement back and forth between South India and Jaffna, and Jaffna considered itself very much as a part, I think, of the sort of Tamil, let's call it the Tamil cosmopolis or the Tamil uh, universe. And uh, I think the fact that they happened to be in Jaffna, um, although that was important, it was by no means uh, some form of separation or exclusion, quite the contrary. And there were people coming from South India to the Jaffna temples on pilgrimage, and I think also to interact with these Jaffna poets. Important to bear that in mind. It's also important to bear in mind, as I said earlier, that these Jaffna poets had some kind of interaction with the singular poets um, uh, elsewhere in the island. So, I mean, this was a world in which there was tremendous uh, communication and movement. Now, if we go uh, back to the first part of your question, can I just say something about why this happened? Um, I don't really know why it happened. It's really hard to say. The Jaffna kings, um, the actual um, political power of the Jaffna kings had come to an end by uh, the late um, 17th century, although the kings were still there. In fact, they are, the families are still there in Jaffna. They're there. Um, and I think they were capable of going on patronizing poets and musicians and artists and sculptors even after they had lost their political power. That was also, to some extent, the pattern in South India, you know, the, the, the Sanayak kings who were also uh, more, um, how shall I say, um, uh, 
deprived of their physical uh, military and political power, but they went on patronizing the poets in all of the languages, and there were many. I mean, Tamil and Telugu and Sanskrit and uh, Marathi and uh, Kannada, and sometimes even in Malayalam, they were quite capable of patronizing these people because they had those kinds of resources. They still had tremendous income. So I think maybe something like that happened in Jaffna. That is to say there was an inverse relation between the actual possession of political power and the patronage and the uh, artistic and cultural renaissance that came once that political power was gone. There's an inverse relation. Once they were freed from the burden of fighting people like the Dutch and the Portuguese and the English, they were able to concentrate on things that really mattered, like, for example, Tamil poetry. You know, um, so maybe that's one partial, uh, but really only partial explanation. And one could also say things. I mean, I'm not the person to answer this, but there, there are things that um, that relate to the economic situation in Jaffna in the 18th century, which was perhaps. Um, perhaps um, better than one might have expected because of the developments that were going on throughout the whole region, including South India. There was a new kind of economy, a cash-based economy. And uh, I think that was probably also the case in Jaffa. Can I ask something? Sure, go yes. ahead, Jazzy. <laughs> this is, uh, I'm so sorry I came in late. Uh, um, Dr. Shulman, I really enjoyed your lecture, and I wanted to ask you a question which is perhaps influenced by my study of Western literature in the USA. And I find it fascinating that you are studying Tamil literature at this side of the world. But yeah. what I used to constantly find, and I'm finding here, is that the form and style of poetry, like the Andadi and the Madaka, in a way reflect the philosophical, which go beyond the religious and cultural beliefs of this whole region, which is yeah. that of uh, continuity and this cyclical quality of life, that mm. there is no linear beginning and end. I think Nalina yeah. mentioned this in her email as well. And that seems to be repeated in the style of poetry, which is unusual, but it is as unusual as is our belief that uh, our lives never really end. We either rebirth or uh, whatever happens has happened before and will happen again. Uh, would you say that the style and the philosophical beliefs connect? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a, first of all, thank you for the question. It's a very thoughtful and interesting question. Um, I tend to think, um, you know, there was a great literary scholar um, Auerbach, who um, wrote a wonderful book called Mimesis, in which he argued that syntax, he was interested only really in syntax, that syntax was always a mirror reflecting the idea of the sort of cosmological idea of reality that was prevalent at the time of the person who was writing or composing, you know. So um, I think that Auerbach um, was right about that, but it's too limited view because it's not only syntax there's an entire texture that has all kinds of other things like the phono aesthetic element um, like the uh, lexical texture uh, like uh, grammatical elements uh, like all kinds of semantic properties i mean if you could make a long list of things that go into producing a kind of texture and that texture as a whole has to be in some way um, I don't know, in correspondence to uh, the world and the vision of the world, the understanding of the world that the poets lived in. It has to be like that. Yes, um, that's what I think. I, that, I, having said that, I, I, I want to say I'm not sure it's only, it's only about time and cyclical time and, and endless time. It's not only about that. There's other elements that are there. I yes. think that in, in pre-modern um, South Asia, and like everywhere in the world, people lived in multiple temporal modes, multiple temporalities. All of us live like that. And that's also true, I think, for the Tamil case. I have no doubt about it. I'm interested in that and I've written about that. So you could say that the notion of some kind of, I don't know, um, ongoing living continuity, that's somehow there embedded in the style. I think that's truly the case. A friend of mine once said an anthropologist, a good anthropologist who worked in Sri Lanka, 
he said in um, he said in Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan villages, it's almost impossible to die. Nobody ever really dies. I mean, they may formally seem to die, but actually they're still there all the time. So that's <laughs> true, I think. It's true, it's difficult because yes. that world is so so full of life. That part of it is certainly certainly the case. Yeah. And also that that uh, descriptions often show that the lives of the gods and the lives of the human mirror each other, not only just the human, but even the monkeys, like you said, of them throwing bananas, and yeah, it could yeah. be poets <laughs> throwing verses, that in, in, in our kind of beliefs, the animal and the, and the person and the trees, they are all linked, and we're all yeah. part of one integral nature, yeah, which yeah. is not that one God made everything, but we are all part of everything. Yeah, I agree entirely. Actually, everything has consciousness in this world. Everything has a kind of awareness, maybe different intensities and levels, but the, um, the monkeys and the hawk and the other birds and even the rocks and the trees, as you said, they're all in some way sentient uh, beings, I think. You know, yeah. right. Thank, Thank you, you. Jayaji. Um, we have um, a question from Mahesh Kumar. Yep. Mahesh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and turn on your video so Dr. Shulman can see you. I can see you. Nice yeah. to see you. It's good to, it was a very good discourse from you, Dr. Shulman. We really enjoyed it. And that too about a work that is the rarest of the rare, this and I don't know how many I would have even heard of it. So uh, it is always good to listen to such things from somebody from the other side of the hemisphere. So now that you have seen the Santati uh, format in, in, in Tamil, which where the music is also intertwined into this, uh, the decorative or ornamental format, in any languages that is descendant of say Latin or Cyrillic, have you come across such a, a very kind of a unique kind of uh, format in any other language in your yeah. researches? Yeah, so, you know, this is not my field exactly, but I can tell you for sure um, that um, in medieval Latin, in Catalan, that is to say the language of Provence, the Provencal uh, troubadours, uh, in early Italian, uh, we, have, uh, we have somewhat parallel mechanisms. So there are all kinds of, um, of uh, devices that uh, would not look uh, exotic at all to people who know Tamil or Sanskrit or Telugu poetry. You know, they are very similar, uh, including the bitextual, um, you know, Shlesha Sleda uh, works. I mean, that's certainly there. And this kind of phonetic, um, let's call it phonetic recursivity or repetition, that is certainly there. And the ornaments of sense that we know I mean, they've been very elaborately cataloged in the uh, Alankara Shastra, also by the, ta the Tamil poeticians. Uh, we, we find parallels to them already in Latin from the, um, the uh, third and fourth century. You know, there's a great um, Latin grammar, which is uh, similar in so many ways to the, um, the uh, um, ornaments of sound and sense. By the way, you would find very similar things in classical Arabic and Persian poetry. Very similar things, including these bitextual techniques, including the phonetic repetition. Um, you know, uh, phonetic repetition, very much in the style that we are seeing here, that's a fundamental building block of the Persian uh, ghazal, which was their primary form. It's built into the ghazal form. Uh, you can't end a line of a poem in a classical Persian ghazal without repeating the initial uh, phonetic sequence, but often with different meanings, you know, just, just like in the Andavi. So I think it would be fair to say that in classical literatures that we know throughout the world, maybe not in all of them, but in many of them, one finds something kind of like that. But uh, having said that, it's important to say that you have to read the Tamil the Tamil or Sanskrit or Telugu or Malayalam forms that these um, uh, these uh, kind of techniques take, you have to read them in their own context, their own texture. There's a certain um, special quality and singularity always in, in any literary uh, tradition, you know, and the Tamil uh, tradition has that uh, uniqueness and singularity about it. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Thank you for the question, Mahesh. And I think with that, we um, come to the end of our lecture and I would like to express our thanks to Dr. Shulman. I'm only sad that we couldn't have you in person with us. Hope to have you here and I think uh, what Mr. Arun meant earlier is that he is actually the head of the Center for mm. Singapore Tamil Culture 
and um, yeah. you know they intended to invite you as well so i hope that happens and it happens <laughs> in person we would very much love to see you here thank you so much for making generous time dr shulman we really enjoyed the lecture it was absolutely stimulating thank you and thank, thank you, you everyone I, thank I, you for inviting me and i hope to see you in singapore someday i'd love to come yeah I apologize for the technical glitches we had earlier, everybody. But like uh, Dr. Shulman said at the start, if some of you missed it, I think we should have prayed to Kalpaka Vinayagar uh, before the yeah. lecture. <laughs> we missed out on that. So we hope to do so to ensure that our lectures going forward run smoothly. Thank you for your time. And we have on screen um, just a QR code. If you want to get in touch with Andadi, please feel free to scan the QR code or you could actually reach out to us through our website. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night.